Welcome, wandering souls and lost sailors, to the Ship of the Dead podcast. Welcome to the maiden voyage of the Ship of the Dead podcast. I'm your host, Luke Stratton, also known as the Pirate Wizard Limithron. Since this is the first episode, I want to give you guys a rundown of what to expect. These episodes are highly edited, so there will be as few gaps and interruptions as possible. Also, episodes are not serial. You can jump around to any single one, uh, unless, of course, we get to an actual play series down the road, which we might. If you have questions or comments, you can email us at chipofthedead at limithron.com. You can support the show over at limithron.com slash Patreon and also get access to hundreds of battle maps, assets, ship plans, and all kinds of good stuff. Without further ado, let's set sail aboard the Ship of the Dead. My guest today is the Any Award-winning author and designer Jacob Hurst of Swordfish Islands. His body of work includes The Dark of Hot Springs Island, The Tomb of Black Sand, The World Builder's Notebook. His next project, The Dark of Marlowe's Meyer, is on Kickstarter now and has just soared past 50k as of today, I believe. Mm-hmm. Jacob, it just hit it. <laughs> welcome aboard the Ship of the Dead. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It's good to be on the ship of the dead, you know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully the circumstances are not dire in which you arrived here. How did you arrive here from a character perspective? From a character perspective, how would I have arrived on the ship of the dead? I don't know. Probably drowning, you know, if you're a pirate, that's just one of those things that happens, right? It's one of the risks. Definitely. (laughs) Very, very likely. Exactly. (laughs) I want to start kind of at the beginning, but I don't, I don't need your backstory. I just want to know, are there any particularly formative memories or experiences that you have playing RPGs? Like, was there like a one shot or or a lunchtime campaign or like a sibling that you would listen to from the closet that really kind of is that formative memory for you? I was in fifth grade. I went over and spent the night at my friend's house. His uncle came into town from Austin. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. So his uncle comes into town and there's there's me and my friend and these other friends from Boy Scouts, right? And I think there were a couple other people that I didn't know, but it was like, hey, let's play Dungeons and Dragons, you guys. And I'm like, I don't even know what this is. This sounds great. So, of course, I immediately decided that I was going to make a thief. And I had my dagger. And the way that the Dungeon Master started the game was very traditional. You guys are in a tavern. You're here. I think we even had the old man in the cloak or whatever who was going to be giving us our quest and stuff. I mean, it was very vanilla. But then it immediately erupted into a bar fight. So this bar fight starts happening. People start brawling. There's combat. There's all this stuff. So then I'm there, 11 years old. And I'm like, okay, so I'm a thief, right? There's a fight going on okay, I'm going to jump up on this bar and I'm going to rob the barkeeper. I've got a dagger, (laughs) right? And so the DM's like, well, are you sure you want to? Sure, yeah, of course, you can go do do that. So I jump up on the bar and I say, give me all your money, give me the cash box. And then (laughs) the bartender proceeds to like swipe my legs out from under me. And I try to stab at him with a dagger. And I immediately realize how absolutely shitty D4 damage is in a game. (laughs) So I was annihilated behind the bar while there's a bar fight rolling on the other side. And I was immediately hooked. Like that was it. And so then we played Dungeons and Dragons constantly, almost every weekend through middle school, high school, all that stuff. What what uh, system was this? Uh, we used first edition Dungeons and Dragons with the big Afrit on the cover. But then, of course, it was like a hodgepodge of home rules and stuff. And there were things that my friend had picked up from his uncle that looking back now, you know, they were from like OD&D stuff. So it was really kind of like a blend of the two. And that worked great. Then we eventually moved into like second edition, but we were still playing first edition, you know, AD&D as opposed to second edition. It was more of like, we want some of the class stuff from that. So it was a hodgepodge of, of stuff, but it was great. And I loved it. Well, as a, a related aside, one day I was at this awesome bookstore in north of denver called black and red which is spelled like read r-e-a-d and they had all these old adventures and modules and stuff and i remember thinking like man jacob would have great advice on what to get here (laughs) and i i sent you a message i was like dude i'm at this store what should i get and you were like this is a quote everyone should have a copy of the first edition dmg and if you don't already it's so good i wonder if you can you elaborate because it's clearly that same kind of era what about that first edition dmg is so captivating for you i mean i know that there were more people that participated in it than gygax but so much of it seems it feels when reading it 
like this thing sort of came from Gary Gygax's brain. Like it has this very consistent voice and it's very eccentric and it has all of these different little things in it that are supremely useful, I think, for coming up with adventures on your own, you know, for Dungeons and Dragons, obviously. And and the way that it kind of bounces through stuff and it's like, here, let's talk about how to build a castle and let's talk about the infamous like prostitute table. And in fact, I was in another discussion. They were saying that they were playing in these games and I think it was specifically like travel where it had all of these rule systems in it for like ship combat or building ships or something like that and they never used it ever in like the, all of the time that they played it like you know when we played Dungeons and Dragons we never built castles but having those castle rules in the book really does a good job of sort of setting the space for the world even if you don't use the rules even if you don't use the tables they let you know like well these are the kinds of things that should be here these are the basic assumptions for what this fantasy world or sci-fi world is like and that just makes it easier for you to fit things in but you know again just all of the to go back to the the dmg particularly just every time i read through it it feels like there's something new and i've read through it so many times over the course of my life and it's just like every time there's just another little thing that jumps out at me one of the things that i've been super i don't know i'm almost obsessed with like i really want to run an open table game where people can come and go and the player base is is shifting because apparently like i didn't know this when i started playing apparently that's the way that it started out as right is that you had this open table and people would come and they would play a character and they would go away and and that piece of information a lot of bloggers and stuff started talking about it recently. And it seems like a key to understanding so many of the old school rules and the old school assumptions. And like, I want to try that. I could never think to myself that I had seen that rule before in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And then I go back through the the DMG looking for some stuff recently, just like, oh, let me get some ideas. And then there was the rule that was talking about how it basically talking about the, the open table assumption. I tweeted it and I don't have it pulled up, but I feel like I should, I should reference it. It kind of reminds me of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Mm-hmm. That was like my seminal, like, oh my God, prog rock record. Yeah, yeah. And every time I listen to Dark Side of the Moon, it's different because I'm older, you know? Yeah. It's such like a life. I feel like the DMG is kind of the same way. You're like, every time you go through it, you discover something new in there. Well, because I I think that it's because it's almost like it's, oh my gosh, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go over the edge. I'm going to say it's, it's like a piece of art and you're coming to it and like you're bringing your assumptions, but you're seeing this sort of, whole singular creative vision from one person and so every time you interact with that something like that i think you're gonna pick more stuff up so i mean if that's a painting if that's an album if that's the first edition dungeon master's guide i mean because it it makes sense because it all came from one brain even though i know it didn't but like it's still there was that single unifying voice at least that came through so I don't know (laughs) i want to talk about your output as a creator i feel like you are on the unique scale of creators in that you really put, I, for lack of a better word, love into your product. <laughs> and I think as a point of example, I want to use Tomb of Black Sand. So I guess a little backstory here on Jacob and I. I discovered Neverland 5e in Barnes & Noble. Loved that book. I was like, this look, doesn't look like a 5e. I bought it. It's and great. I'm like, this is a great way to do a book. And Andrew Kolb's coming on the show in a couple weeks, I think. Oh, awesome. He's such a good dude. Oh, he's incredible, dude. And I get to the like acknowledgement credits page and he's like, yo, just check out Hot Springs Island. It basically like a, com- <laughs> a command. I'm like, what? I like, I don't know anything about the OSR. I don't, I've never heard of Hot Springs Island. And I go to your website and I buy basically everything. <laughs> and, and I put in a message in the comments that I'm like, hey, if you guys ever want battle maps, like hit me up and you hit me up, which I was not expecting. So we ended up doing this Tomb of Black Sands foundry module where I read it all the maps in full color, blah, 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 blah. You can check it out online. But I just wanted to say, like, I remember going through the process and I think most publishers would have been like, all right, here, here's the book. You're going to do a map. Let's put all this stuff in there. But I mean, I have a list of the things that we did for that. You hired new art, new cover art, music, little voiceover snippets. We had Gabe remake tokens for every monster full color, which he doesn't usually do. We did a, a town map that wasn't... I mean, basically, we like remade that whole thing. And I just... I remember coming out of the experience being like, man, I wish more creators had that... <laughs> level of enthusiasm for the thing that they're putting into the world. I, I, w- I just wanted to see if you could maybe talk about that a bit. 
I'm trying to think of the best story to tell to encapsulate that. The the summary line is when we were working on Hot Springs Island, the thing that we would say to each other all the time, well, and when we were working on Swordfish Islands, because that's how it started. We're working, we're making Swordfish Islands, we're making this chain of islands, and we would be brainstorming stuff up and we would say, okay, we're going to go big or go to hell, go big or go to hell. And that was kind of our, our refrain. But maybe a better story to tell is when I was in When I was in Boy Scouts, we went to summer camp one year and we had these half wall army tents and that that we were using to to camp in. And so me being who I was and having my my Dungeons and Dragons stuff and having my magic cards and having, you know, the big sort of trunk that my clothes were in for the for the trip. I started talking to people and I was like, hey guys, with these half wall army tents, we could put them together and we could like make a big <laughs> a giant tent. And so tent I think City. I got, there were at least four, maybe five tents that we all put together and we sort of connected the tops and made this sort of like over overhang area. So we had our sleeping area and then there was a large middle section where we were able to play games and play magic and play D&D, you know, at nighttime and have our lanterns and everything like that. And I just remember at one point the scoutmaster came over and he's like, what's going on over here? Like, who's tinted? Oh, Jacob. You're the one who came, who had the idea. Okay, I see. I understand now. So I don't know. I don't know. I just, I want it to be, if you're going to spend the time to make it, make it as cool as possible because I I don't know. I I don't know if that's super pretentious or what, but it's like, that's what it needs to be. And and the, the thing that was so tricky for me mentally, I guess, about the Tomb of Black Sand in particular is that the book and the Foundry module or any virtual tabletop module, they have different abilities. Like they have different things that you can do. So I'm like, you need to have that stuff in there. Like in the Tomb of Black Sand, you've got a singing banshee and... I was on Instagram and there's this lady, Nina Diaz, who was in a, who's here in San Antonio. She was in a band called Girl in a Coma. And, you know, I love their music. Like we played the Girl in the Coma version of As the World Falls Down, like their cover of As the World Falls Down from Labyrinth. We like, we played that as one of the songs in our wedding when I got married. And so love that song, love her work. She's posting on Instagram around the same time saying like, hey, you know, like I'm taking commissions. Like if you want me to sing a song for, you know, do a cover for somebody that you love or whatever like just hit me up and we can we could talk so then i was like oh so are you taking commissions do you want to sing some like banshee kind of lullabies <laughs> and she was like yeah sure so i was like well you can put that into a virtual tabletop module and you can play it at the through the thing which you can't do through a book so it's like well let's just do this and and see what happens and so you know we've seen what happens <laughs> yeah well i think the misstep is that it was such a cool thing that we we almost should have just kickstarted it again to let to announce to the world absolutely you know? well and that's that's kind of the big learning experience i think that i've gotten is that i I feel my theory at this point um, is that there just really is a very different audience for the people who buy books and and run that stuff and the people who play predominantly on virtual tabletops. Oh my God, a thousand. Yeah. And so if you come in and you're like, I have built this awesome thing out of nowhere, nobody knows who you are. They don't see it. It doesn't get picked up by the algorithm or anything, which is fine. But just, I didn't have the complete expectation of this is a completely separate audience and you're going to need to court the audience for a while in order to you know have anybody pay attention to you and so i was just like no we're gonna build it we're gonna make it it's gonna have all this stuff so it was a good learning experience and i love i love how it turned out i think it's awesome i I mean i think the the product still stands for itself if Mm -hmm. i can be if i may be so bold (laughs) but i mean i had a similar experience with my patreon and then my kickstarter where Oh, well, like I have a MailChimp, right? And I have like all Mm -hmm. these emails I've collected from people joining and like leaving and joining the Patreon, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I ran my Kickstarter and then I was like, okay, it's time to merge in. And I expected there to be, you know, maybe a 50% overlap of people who kickstarted a book versus people who buy virtual tabletop maps. And my email list pretty much doubled, which is great for the size of the list. But like, I couldn't believe how little overlap there was. Mm -hmm. And I really, I really just think it's not that they're two different groups, but I don't know, maybe they, they're just people consume things differently. Yeah. Well, it's a different approach. It's a different approach when you're playing. And and like Olivia Hill did a tweet a couple days ago that was very interesting. I thought basically it was about freemium or stuff where it was saying that people who brag the most about how you don't have to spend any money to play tabletop role-playing games have themselves spent a ton of money so yeah so the the thing is is that 
I think that when you do play, you it's very easy to play tabletop role playing games without really expending any money. Like when I was playing as a kid, you know, we spent not like we had my friend's uncle's books, and we got together and we played constantly, and we didn't spend a dime. But I think that. RPGs are really kind of like an early freemium model, if you will, because you can play for free, but there's all of this cool stuff that you can get. You can get these dice, you can get these minis, you can get these books, you can get these modules. And so over the course of like 10, 15, 20 years of playing, you accumulate all of this stuff and you accumulate all of these resources that are kind of tailored to the way that you and your group likes to play. And I think that that same thing happens with, you know, the people who play predominantly on virtual tabletop because it's like, well, I've spent a lot of money or I've spent a lot of time going out and finding maps and assets and token packs and sound packs and all kinds of stuff to play like this. And so I don't even think that it's necessarily, you know, like an intentional break. I think it's almost like a, like an inertia kind of thing where it's like, well, I've spent all this time, effort and money over here to sort of specialize in this. And I didn't mean to specialize. It just happened. And, and so that's kind of where I think the audience split break is if you will yeah and i mean i think you can't ignore uh the pandemic in the vtt conversation absolutely absolutely i think you know so many people found a new way to play and you know i i know for me when i'm prepping before i got into being a professional creator when i'm prepping games like i prepped by finding visual assets i'm very visual like i Mm want to see those assets and i would collect all these different maps and i would even in, in person i would print them out at fedex office or whatever But then I found as I actually go to run games, like I don't want to be limited by the maps. Yeah. I actually like to just go totally nuts. And then when you explain things to be, you know, so the two are are disagreeing with each other at some times. Well, I think it's the starting point. I think it's the frame of reference. It gives you sort of context. Then, then you go from there. Because I mean, that's the thing that makes role playing games forever better than a video game. Because you can literally do anything. Like you can decide that I'm going to climb this wall. You can decide yes. that I'm going to start trying to you know dig a hole through a mountain. As stupid as it sounds, like no, we have magic and we're going to figure out how to do that. Which you can't do that kind of stuff in video games unless it's been programmed in in some way you know it has to be able to account for that kind of thing so i mean yeah you start with you start with something you start with your framework and then everybody goes crazy and off the wall and you know or climbs the wall and it's great yeah exactly absolutely i wouldn't trade it for anything i mean that's a lot of what makes it so so special i guess in a way I want to talk to you about the dark of hot springs island sure. for so many obvious reasons and then i think from there we can curtail that into marlo's mire but the dark of hot springs island is in a lot of ways like the seminal hex crawl now people just kind of reference it i know you may not feel that way but especially in my discord you know i run a pirate focused discord people always bring it up as if you're going to run a jungle hex crawl, you need to at least look at the dark of hot springs island yeah. so i wondered if you could talk a little bit about the origins of the mechanics specifically there's three things i really want to talk about the navigation system with the poker chips and the time of day kind of thing the description style with you know the main bold word and then the sub descriptions in brackets mm-hmm. and then the random encounter system the whole 3d6 motivational table thing maybe you can tie those all into one big answer i guess ultimately the thing with the swordfish islands and the, the way that i approach all of this and have approached all of this is that i've been making things that i wanted to make for myself but i've also been making things to try and solve the things that i am bad at so i have always felt when I've been running games or playing games that like overland travel is really freaking difficult when you're playing, I mean, anything like it kind of goes into the idea of the mythic underworld. And one of the ideas with the mythic underworld is there, there has to be sort of like an entrance, you know, Alice goes into the rabbit hole in order to get into wonderland. And so I think that when you're doing an overworld kind of thing, there's this drive that a lot of people have to, you have your starting area and your adventure area is far away from the starting area, and you want to try and sort of put in that, like you're crossing a threshold by taking a journey. And it's really freaking hard to pull that off. Like, it's not easy. A lot of the times it falls flat. I think that's one of the reasons that there's the RPG trope of like, oh, you guys are caravan guards. So you're going from like your hometown into the great unknown. And then, oh, look at that. You got attacked by bandits just outside of the dungeon entrance. Huzzah. Because DMs are wanting to put in that kind of thing, that kind of feeling. So overland travel is just, 
I, I feel like a lot of the times it's approached from that context or from that framework. And so the idea for me was the thing with the travel system was like, let's come up with a way that makes it sort of easy or as easy as possible, but still give meaning to travel related to that. So we have this really awesome map of Hot Springs Island that Jason Thompson of, of mockman.com that he made. He's done a bunch of maps before. He was actually the first Kickstarter I ever backed. I've wanted him to make maps for me for forever. And he made this fantastic, it's kind of a, I hate to say the word cartoony, but it is a cartoony, like a Where's waldo kind of vibe of Hot Springs. And I absolutely love it. But one of the most consistent pieces of feedback that I get from from people, from players, customers, what have you, is they're like, I don't want to show this map to my players because it's got so many spoilers on it. It's going to spoil everything. And I'm over here like, no, 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 no. It's not going to spoil anything because when you give your players that map and you let them see the things that are on the island and see the places that they can go, they're the ones who are going to drive it. And then when you tack on this navigation system where you're spending time, you be, it's kind of board gamey you have moves, right? Like moving from one hex to another hex, it takes you four hours. And the reason for that is so that the real crux of the of the problem or the the conflict engine, if you will, in my opinion with Hot Springs, is that exploration is very important, but a lot of the problem is not exploration focused. The The problem comes from our party needs to be in three different places at the same time on the night of the new moon. And we can't actually do that by walking because it's too far. So we have to come up with some really clever solutions to do this stuff. So by by having the navigation system and making it very clear through the use of like poker chips, where it's like, okay, you're currently in this four hour block of time. What are you going to do? My hope and my goal was to make sure that people know that they, they are making a meaningful decision. They are making a meaningful choice because this is your limited period of time. What are you really going to do? Are you going to try and go someplace new? Are you going to stay inside the hex where you are and maybe interact with the faction that's there? Like, what's your move for right now? Because the world is moving and things are happening on hot springs that don't necessarily concern the players or care about the players. The world is moving on its own. And so the players are moving within that milieu, I guess, to use fancy words. It's It was just just to try and make people more aware of the choice and give meaning to time without it having to be like a big pain in the ass to track. Like, I don't want you to have to pull out a spreadsheet and be like, okay, it's this time and it's this time and it's this time. Yeah. So basically the system is six poker chips, two black for night, two white for day, and then a red one for dawn and for dusk. And you just stack them to show, okay, you're going to do that, but it's going to cost you a poker chip. And now it's later in the day. And then you guys have rules for going to a new hex costs a chip yep. or you know, exploring for more locations in this hex costs a chip. If you want to double move, you will, might get lost, that kind of stuff, right? Right, yeah. And 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 the thing is, is that it's not super hard and fast. And, you know, four hours can be a long time. But the idea was, this is an, an abstraction to make it more manageable. Because sure. you don't want to get too deep into the nitty gritty. But obviously, if it's like, oh, hey, we have a guide who's going to show us how to get through the jungle here. Well, maybe you move faster and maybe you get some extra. Or if it's like we're walking down a nice paved road in a civilized area, well, then sure, you're going to be going faster than than what it is so it's not hard and fast but i you know just a good framework because because again overland travel is something that i feel like i always sucked at being a dm so i was like i just want to come up with a system that hopefully makes it easier for me and then if other people like it awesome <laughs> the cheat card in this particular scenario is that mm -hmm. if you're running you know let's say you crack open the dmg and you're like building your world and you're going to do a hex crawl and you're going to do six mile hexes well you still have to decide what's in each one of those and in hot springs mm -hmm. island there are two mile hexes and there are three really cool things in every single hex. So it's, it's kind of like you also are providing the prep that a GM would need to do that overland travel and have it be exciting, you know? Yeah. Well, and so, and then that, that leads very nicely into yes. the next thing with the, the bolded words and the way that we, we did the descriptions, I think, because we wanted there to be a ton. We wanted there to be a lot. One of the things that I was thinking of a lot, and I guess I'm still thinking of a lot is that I think there is, okay, we're going to get, we're going to go out into the weeds for a moment, but I think that humans 
over time, as we have existed on planet Earth, have done a whole lot to figure out how to deal with scarcity. We have a lot of systems, we have a lot of solutions that are like, these are ways that people can deal with scarce resources, scarce time, scarce whatever. And I think that, you know, with the advent of digital stuff, and, and just maybe the point where we are with our civilization and technology, I think that we're starting to discover a problem of abundance. And I don't think that people have a language to deal with a problem of abundance. Because, right, when you make a book, you have a physical object, you've chopped down a tree, you've turned that tree into paper, you've bound it, you've used you know cotton thread to sew it up together, you've put ink on the pages. There's only one book I can only have the book. I can't give you the book as well. The book is like a scarce, finite object. But a PDF or a digital file, theoretically, every single person on the world could have a copy of it for effectively free. And so, you know, when people start talking about like piracy and stuff like that, it's like, is piracy even the right word to describe what's really going on? And I don't think it is, but I'm, you know, kind of a weirdo like that. And so that was one of the things with, with Hot Springs Island is that I wanted it to be sort of this problem of abundance where it's like, there's money everywhere. There's stuff everywhere what are you going to do? How are you going to make choices in this sort of like abundant landscape where there's just tons of locations and tons of treasure and tons of of gold, right? And then deal with the consequences of those problems. All right, so you guys have gotten all this money and you've taken it back to your home kingdom and now you've caused this like horrific inflation to go on. Thanks for playing. What do you do now? Like, how do you deal with that or solve that? Or do you just quit the campaign and do something different? So, but then, you know, one of the problems, obviously from the side of, stuff that's been written up in the book is how do you convey a massive amount of information to people at the table without it becoming completely overwhelming? And, well, and how do you get that information into a DM's head so they can... So they can keep it there without you know it turning into to mush and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So I think it was probably like 2010, 2011, something like that. Courtney Campbell, who does the blog Hack Slash Master had a version of this using these bolded words where it's like, here's a bolded word, and then here's the description that follows it. So for example, the bolded word will be chest, and then in parentheses or brackets or just in a different, you know, font following that word chest, it'll say that it's, you know, oak and it's got a rusty lock and it's got whatever. So the idea being that when players come into the room, you can easily say like, oh, there's a chest and a bookcase and a rug on the floor. And then the players, then they say, okay, well, I want to go over and I want to look at the chest. And then at that point, then you say, all right, well, it's it's got the rusty lock on it and it has this and this and this. And you describe things like that. So you, you go through. Because one of the most important pieces, and this is something that Bryce Lynch over at the 10 Foot Pole blog, who does a bunch of reviews, he harps on this all the time, saying that like the core interactive loop of playing tabletop role-playing games is that conversation that's happening between the player and the dungeon master. And it's this it should be a constant back and forth. Where it's like, okay, you see this thing, what do you do? Okay, well, I'm going to go interact with it. Tell me more about it. All right, well, here's the more about it. And so the the breakup of that bolded word followed by that other stuff is, you know, I think a great way to handle that. But the thing is, is that I think that the reason that that post that Courtney wrote resonated with me so much is because the very first game that I got on a computer ever was Ultima 6 by Richard Garriott and everybody. And the way that that game worked is when you would go and talk to a non-player character they would start talking to you and in their text block, there would be words in red, like big, bold red words. And so in order to get more information, you would type the red word that you wanted to know more about. And so then that would run you through the dialogue trees. So as soon as I saw like, oh, hey, here's an idea for putting in bolded words into the text. I was like, dude, it's like Ultima. This is such a good idea. Why am I not seeing this more? This is great. And so we ran with it and that's how it was. Yeah, my biggest takeaway immediately upon, I think it was looking at the free PDF you had on Mm -hmm. Swordfish Island's website, was why, I was almost mad, (laughs) why aren't more RPGs written this way? Yeah. I'm a visual guy, obviously an artist, and I love to read, but like uh, my ADD takes over, I can't read 30 pages of a RPG with no images. But when I when yeah, I open no, up, like here I've got the Lapis Observatory. Like this is Servant's Quarters, just as a demo, right? Servant's Quarters, mm-hmm. number four. It's got door, beds, chairs, trunks, fireplace shelves, cupboards, kitchen implements, drug paraphernalia. That's all I have to know to know what's in that room. 
Yeah. But then you can drill down. Like if you look at the chairs, six wing back velvet fallen, ruin, broken crystal coating. Like there's so much information conveyed, but it's almost like this is the, what you're talking about adventure video game extrapolated back into a book where you're clicking on mm -hmm. them as a DM to learn. Would you like to know more? You know? Well, that's one of the things that made Foundry and making a virtual tabletop thing so interesting and exciting to me because then you literally have a button that's like chair and you click on it and then it has the other description. Yeah. So you only have to fill your mind with what you need to know at the moment. And so then the book or the virtual tabletop adventure can do sort of all of the heavy mental bookkeeping for you because it's really good at that, yeah. you know? So like offload that hard shit, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, why not? But I do think one of the things is, is that writing something like this, I think Mark Twain said it best at one point when he wrote a letter to someone and he starts off the letter saying like, I'm so sorry, like I didn't have the time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. <laughs> and I think that that's really true is that, you know, it can be very easy to just sort of just write all of this stuff. And it's like, well, the information's in there, you'll be able to find it and parse it out. Like taking that step of like, no, I'm going to parse this down. I'm going to distill this down into the most important pieces can be very time consuming. And then it's like, oh, well, why hasn't it, you know, why haven't you released a book in like three years? You can't do that. <laughs> like, it's like, well, yeah, yeah it's, it's tough. I mean, anybody who's run a, a modern fifth edition adventure knows that you can't run those without taking your own notes. Right. Like you have to go through and really pull out what you need because it's, oh, here's a paragraph of backstory and here's a paragraph of description. And, and you have to put in time where I've heard so many people have said with the dark of hot springs Island that I don't know what's in that hex, but we got there and I didn't have to prep. Or you even say in the intro, yeah. like, hey, if you get to somewhere you didn't prep, just take a break and then roll on this table. Mm -hmm. But that's a great way for a DM to you know absorb the information without having to spend their entire life prepping it. You know, And that's the thing. Like, I don't want to spend 60 bucks buying a book and then have to do it a bunch of additional work. Like, I could have just made up my own campaign and done that work in the meantime and set it up for myself. So, like, why am I buying a module that's expecting me to go through with a notepad and a highlighter and whatever in order to get the information out of it. But I think that it's just been so sort of ingrained in the system, you know, uh, over time to just do it that way. I mean, you even do this with the NPCs. With the NPCs, you're like, here's what this guy wants. Here's what he doesn't want. Here's some other stuff. Whereas in a normal, yeah. like traditional adventure, they would tell you what they're doing at every point in the story, which like, well, how do you know that? What if my players blew up that town? Like, you know. Exactly. I think that you have to trust your dungeon masters and trust your players and trust them with the stuff to make the decisions. One of the things that was really inspirational for me very early on is James Raggi, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, wrote this adventure called Death Frost Doom. It's a fantastic adventure. But in that, in that adventure, there is like a chest of drawers, I think it is. And inside that chest of drawers, there are bunches and bunches of snow globes. And the snow globes show Death Frost Mountain like in the snow globe. And the idea is, is that every single one of those snow globes is one of the realities mm, of like a people doing thing. an adventure on mm. Death Frost Mountain. So it's like a multiverse mm. thing, right? Because every single time someone or a group runs an adventure, it's going to be different. It's guaranteed to be different. And so if you're trying to like dictate from on high as I am the adventure designer and this is what this NPC is going to do, I don't think that that's realistic because we know that there's going to be a thousand different variants of what's happening and what the setup is at any given time. So I think it's more important to say, well, like, no, I mean, this is what Sfarku the Afrit, this is what he wants. This is what he doesn't want. These are the things that motivate him like at his core. So when you come to the situation of, okay, the adventuring party has come into the, the volcano, what is Svarku going to be like at that time? Because if they've made friends with the ogres and they're coming in as an emissary of the ogres, like Svarku's going to be very different than if they're coming in as potential new recruits to join the Feuganauts. There's not the page space to dictate or to, to explain all of the different varieties, but I can say Svarku is like a horrible asshole and he's going to be, you know, super self-absorbed about things. So then you, the dungeon master, can infer from that, okay, well, if the players are coming in as representatives of the ogres and they maybe rebuffed his his invitation to join the Fuegonauts, he's going to be really pissed off and he's going to be really shitty about it. 
and you can run with that. Like, you don't need me to tell you. And then he says, you are, a, yeah. you know, like you don't need that. But then to go into the encounter system and to talk about that for like a dungeon, you have three tables and they all use 3D6. And the reason that they use 3D6 is because that gives you a bell curve of probability. So if you roll a three or an 18, that's something exceedingly rare. If you get that result, it's going to change potentially the course of the entire adventure. But if you get a 10 or an 11, it's just a normal day in the dungeon. It's a normal encounter in the dungeon. Like it's it's a regular thing because that's the most likely to find. So first you've got a table called what's happening. And that gives you like a broad general overview for the entire dungeon. It gives you some context for the dungeon or the village, right? And then you have your encounter table that has, here's the creatures that you can find there. And then you have motivations because everybody's doing something. One of my default assumptions that I think that I should have probably communicated a little a little more clearly in Hot Springs Island is that I always sort of assume that the players are going to go first unless there is an ambush situation. So I always tend to operate from like, okay, so you roll an encounter that says that there are six salamanders that are playing dice or they're gambling with each other. The way that I would present that is, okay, you guys are coming into the room or you're as you're approaching the room, you can see six salamanders inside that room and it looks like they're playing dice or playing cards or something like that and so they're talking and laughing and whatever what do y'all want to do so then the players make that first sort of move in there the only exception of course being well if the salamanders are waiting in ambush then they're hidden and things are going to play out differently I know that there are some people that are like, man, I have to make so many. They use more like an old school D&D system. And so they make all these reaction rolls in addition to what we have in the tables, you know, to see are the salamanders friendly or unfriendly or whatever. And I just kind of hand wave over that and say like, oh, no, you see them. They're playing cards. How are you guys going to approach it? Yeah, I feel like reaction rolls are for like, I don't know what they want. But like, I'm not going to roll a reaction right. roll for when you, you know, walk in on a family and they're eating dinner and you look like you're about to kill them. Like they're going to be scared, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But the reason that we did the encounter system in this way is that number one, it has that bell curve of probability. And so what's really cool with that. So like there's this place called the Shattered Aquifer of Pythiaria, where a large section of that is you have this elemental conflict going on between the forces of water and the forces of magma. And they're sort of fighting each other in this field. So you have an equal amount of probability on both sides of the table of the the rolling table and you have an equal number of spaces on either side of the rolling table for half of your table you can put forces of water encounters and for half of your table you can put forces of magma encounters and you have the same probability of encountering both of those because ultimately the whole goal with doing sort of the complex encounter tables like this was to again to let the book and the encounter tables do the heavy lifting for you so the world is supposed to be moving and doing its own thing and the monsters don't care about the players until they have to care about the players and so then you should be able to roll on these tables to see what's been happening in the world so that as the dm you're not having to constantly track like okay so svarku has gone from the volcano to this other location on the island and now we're going to do whatever you can just put in there well there's like a two percent chance that svarku is going to be in this place and if it happens it happens and that changes the course of your game i also really like the idea that this really like encapsulates that emergent gameplay concept where the gm like they maybe know what's going on with the party, but like imagine it's like a TV show where you're the cameras are on the party and they're not going to reveal what the bad guy you haven't met has been doing the whole time. And then the tables help you realize, oh, well, now the, the Efreets are in a war and you didn't know this was happening, but it is. And this is the top of the episode. What do you do? You know? Right. Yeah, exactly. And so then you have to sort of deal with those consequences. Now, of course, as the as the GM, if things have been going in a certain way and you want them to keep going in that way and that result derails everything, well then sure, sure. change it and make it whatever you want. But if you want to be more, I don't know, naturalistic and say like, dude, here's what's happened. Like, here's the new reality. Like, what do you want to do? Like, I think it does a really good job of, of doing that so that you can fly sort of more by the, by the seat of your pants, let the, let the chips fall sure. where they may and, and, you know, go from there. All right. I have a few more Hot Springs Island questions. Sure. I wondered if you could speak to me about the use of Transat font. What is there a particular reason you picked this font? I love fonts. I know you know this. I love your layout. Why? Why Transat? It's the it's the font for the entire book. Like for all the titles, for all the mini texts. It's the whole. It's the font. 
the first edition D and D books, which made a big impact on me, are all done in Futura. You know, to get all the faces and everything is a little more expensive and i didn't have the money at the time and there's this great website called design cuts and they will do bundles of stuff where you can get like a bundle of fonts for 29 bucks and you get all of these fonts and they had transat up there and it's kind of i think it's sort of like a modernization i was gonna say it looks like a more futuristic futura (laughs) yes and i love it And I thought it was beautiful. And so I went with it. So I don't know if that was the best choice. Maybe I should have done like a Sarah body and all that kind of stuff. But I I think it's kind of a tip to the like kind of the Morkborg thing of like, hey, this isn't in world. Morkborg has a bunch of code fonts, you know, like typewriter fonts. Mm -hmm. Those aren't in world. And like this, this is a piece of information, almost like an, an alien has studied this world and wrote a report for... Yeah. GMs to absorb it. And I feel like getting by getting the fonts out of the way and using this nice, clean, easy to use font, it does a great job of conveying that information to the GM. Bravo. Awesome. I really like those geometric fonts yeah. like that. I think they're great. I picked it because it was like a future knockoff. Yeah, great. <laughs> My next question is why do you think there aren't more books like the field guide to Hot Springs Island? This is an in-world book you can find and give it, literally give the book to your players. This is the opposite of what we just talked about with the there's fonts and handwriting and sketches. Why aren't there more books like that? Because it's really time consuming and it's hard. It's risky because you have to have more boxes of books. The reason that we did the field guide, again, was to solve one of my own personal problems. And that was the way that Dungeons and Dragons modules work, the way that RPGs work is that there is only one book for Ravenloft, basically. That's the box set for Ravenloft, right? Only the Dungeon Master is allowed to buy the box set of Ravenloft and read it. If a player buys Ravenloft and reads Ravenloft, they have spoiled the experience. They know where the secret doors are. They have seen the maps of the world. They have seen all of that stuff. I am kind of a lore whore, if you will. Like, I love my lore. I love my stuff. And so early on, I would find modules and I would pick up and buy modules and I read them because it was cool. But then the problem becomes like, I then have to be the dungeon master because I know everything that's happened. So I I bought it. I have to be the dungeon master. And I didn't necessarily want to be the dungeon master because my friends, I thought, were better dungeon masters than I was. And like, I thought they did such a good job with, you know, the storytelling and all that kind of stuff. I was like, no, I want them to run. But oh, no, I read this module. So now I'm going to need to run it. Right. On the flip side of that, when you look at video games, right? So if you look at something like the World of Warcraft or you look at Quake or you look at whatever, when you do that, every single person who's playing has to buy a copy of the game. Every single person has to spend 60 bucks. But on the tabletop side, only the dungeon master is allowed to spend 60 bucks. But then you have, you know, six people who are playing the game, but there's only been one monetary transaction. So of course, like RPGs, in addition to being hard, because a person has to run them. The only person who's giving money to the company is the person who is running the game, but there are all of these other players. So what can you do for the players? And so my thought was, well, let's make the field guide. And the field guide is an in-world, in-game object. It's written as if people have been to Hot Springs Island. They came back, they sort of compiled up all of their stories and information about the monsters, factions, plants, and stuff that are there. But it's been done in such a way so that a player could have the field guide. So a player can, if they want to, they don't have to, they can buy their own copy of the field guide. They can sort of like pay the company to help it keep making content. But then they've been given something that then gives them context and lore and information about the world so that then as a player, they can drive the game, which I think is really critically important when you're doing a sandbox, right? Players have to have knowledge of the world in order to make any kind of meaningful choice. Like, yes, we can make an assumption that like, okay, so there's a big red dude with horns on his head who looks like a demon who's living in the volcano in the middle of the island. He's probably the bad guy. Well, yes, he is. But let's give you some context about that so that then you can say like, no, he's like really bad. I want to go kill him. Or wait a minute, he's a bad guy, but he wants adventurers to work for him. Maybe we should go check it out sandboxes have to be player driven and if you're just like well here's a map of this world and there's forest to the north and swamps to the south then you know tundra to the east for whatever reason what do you want to do and the players have no context of the world 
I mean, none of their decisions are meaningful. Who cares where we go? Well, I guess we'll go to the forest because I'm an elf. So sure. On the flip side, if you have this guide and you give it to your players, all of a sudden your ranger who, oh, maybe they use the player's handbook to build their character. Well, now they know about 50 different plants that grow on the island. And maybe it's not that they found that in the book. They just already know these things and you've given them yeah. the way to have more buy-in. Yeah, to connect to the world. Yeah, absolutely. And they should. I think that's a great way because then I want to role play being a ranger. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Oh, yes, I know about this jelly moss. I've seen this. I've, I've, I can't believe that you can find it here. This is so great. We can do all, we can get up to all kinds of mischief now because we found this plant. We can glue people to like wooden chairs and stuff. Like, let's do it, guys. And that wouldn't come from a game or a module as easily if the information source is only coming from the dungeon master to the players because at what point is that going to come up at what point is it going to come up that like oh hey guys by the way in this world there's this little plant that works as like a phenomenal glue yeah you know it's basically like a magical super glue kind of yeah. thing it, it's not going to come up so yeah let the players do hijinks and shenanigans. That's what they're there for. Well, I think it also really leads if you're if you're running Hot Springs Island with a an old school system, it really leads to, you know, the referee or or and DCC the judge. It's like, well, I, I don't have to just I don't have to be the lore keeper all the time. You can participate in that experience and I'll just tell you, you know, what the bad guys are doing. Uh, I think the book is great for that. My last bit about Hot Springs Island. Just want to give a shout out to Gabriel Hernandez. His Instagram is Worthy Enemies. For me, he is 50% of the book because I'm an artist. Oh, yeah. Oh, easy. 75. Like, yeah. <laughs> it, it's just like it, it's black and white line art. I think you said he did most of it with a ballpoint pen and you had to scan it in. No, it's all pencil. Pencil. Pen it, and it's, it's all pencil. But and his, I scan it, yeah. he has this like kind of. It's like comic booky, but like, oh, I didn't finish it, but in a way that captivates your imagination more. I don't know. I've heard you say before that the fact that it's not colored is is better, and I, I couldn't agree more. I just want, maybe you could talk about your relationship with him. Sure. First off, with the artwork for Hot Springs, like we kind of, he sort of hated me a bit because I said like, no, dude, I want you to leave like the sketch marks. I want you to leave the sort of unfinished <laughs> lines where like you started doing a circle over here for the shape, like, and as you know, remnants of that, you didn't erase it all the way. Like I want that in there. And for me, that all goes back to the idea that every single game of Hot Springs Island or any RPG is going to be different for that table, for that stuff. Everyone's going to imagine all of these creatures differently. They're going to see them differently inside of their head. And so I think that when you have this more sketchy black and white art, it leaves it open to more potential and more possibilities. When you start putting color on something, like you lock it down. Like, yes, we know that Svarku's skin is red and we know that he's an Ifrit and we know he's associated with fire. But the way, when I say like, oh, there's this dude with red skin, you're going to imagine that red in a different way than somebody else is going to imagine that red, who's going to imagine it differently than another person who imagines it red. But as soon as you do a color like here is a drawing with this shade of red, you sort of fix it in place more. And so I wanted it to be much more open where it's like, let it go anyway. We're just giving you this framework. We're just giving you this idea. We're going to tell you some words and we know that those words are going to be interpreted differently. And that's good. That's okay. Like we need to embrace that reality of, of RPGs and roll with it. And so like in the beginning, he was like, are you, sh I feel like this is so unfinished. I feel like I need to ink this. I feel like I need to do this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is literally perfect. Like leave it like it's this. Perfect, yeah. And he's like, I, I, I can't, <laughs> yeah. but no, I think it, I think it worked out great. I love, I love it. I love his artwork so much. Well, he's just so naturally talented that like his sketches are better than most people's finals, you know, yeah. like his, <laughs> right. his well, form is like, it's incredible. Yeah. I don't want to dog him on this. There are so many artists out there that like I follow on Instagram because I'm I'm always looking. I'm always looking for artists. And there are so many times where I feel like so many artists, like their sketches are better than their final. Yeah. Like there's almost this point that when they start rendering it, especially with color, color yeah. is so fucking hard to do. 
and I find so many times, like I'll see artwork that someone's done and it's got color on it. And I'm like, Oh, I don't like this. And then I see the sketch and I'm like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Like I want to work with this person. Like, this is so great, but like, you're not allowed to color anything, you know? But then how do I say that? Right. Without being like a total horrible asshole. No, you can't. Yeah. (laughs) I see that with some battle map makers where you're like their old stuff is more in line with what, like they got better at certain elements that I actually don't like in battle maps, you know, (laughs) kind of one of those things. Okay. So I think that brings us to the topic of the day. The big real reason we're here. Marlowe's Meyer. Can you Mm -hmm. give us, give us the elevator pitch for this new expansion into more swordfish islands? Yeah. So Marlowe's Meyer is the smallest island in the Swordfish Islands. There are multiple islands to the Swordfish Islands, and we have rough notes for locations for three points of interest in every single hex on the Swordfish Islands as a whole. And we, you know, we've brainstormed that out and we've kind of been sitting on that for a long time. But the thing is, is that at the time we started making it so big that it was like, well, we have to do one island and get that one island done. And that island that we chose was Hot Springs Island. So that's why that was the first one that came out. So Hot Springs is 25 hexes. There are two islands called the Spire Islands because they have this gigantic light spire kind of... I was calling it a lighthouse, but it's not like an East Coast lighthouse. It's more like that spire that's in the never-ending story, oh, you know? exactly what I was With picturing. With the princess up in it. Like, it's that kind of thing, yeah. yeah. The, the elves built it forever ago. Who knows what it really does? Do we even know what it does? I don't know at this point, but uh, they're there. And so we've been working on the Spire Islands off and on, but, you know, everybody's got jobs and lives and kids and stuff like that. And so it's a process. But the cool thing is, is that both of those islands have lizard men that live on them. There's like the green scaled lizard men and the blue scaled lizard men. And if you take those two islands together, they're 26 hexes total, which is approximately the same size as Hot Springs Island. So the idea was, okay, we're going to work on the Spire Islands. We're going to put them together and release them together as a book because there's a lot of linkages between them and because it's approximately the same size density as Hot Springs Island. So it makes sense as a, as a thing. When we came to this point to do the third printing of of Hot Springs, prices have gone up a lot. We needed a little something. And our perspective at the time was, well, we don't know how this Kickstarter is going to go. And so we had a meeting. It was me and Evan and Donnie. And we got together and we talked because we had different options. Like we have some little like zine projects and some little not Swordfish Islands related things that we've kind of been, you know, tinkering with here and there, kind of like a Tomb yeah. of Black Sand situation. Or the World Builders know about Exactly. Yeah. And so we had a discussion of like, well, how should we go forward? What should our choice be? We're going to do a Kickstarter. What should we do? And so we decided, you know what? We're going to do Marlowe's Island. And so we went with it because Marlowe's Island originally was only supposed to be two hexes and it's very centrally located in the Swordfish Islands. There's a crazy wizard who lives on it. His name is Marlo. He looks like a shipwrecked hobo as opposed to a wizard. He's kind of crazy. So up my alley. It's not even funny. <laughs> yeah. He's kind of crazy. All he does is he brews alcohol. Like that's his main thing because the secret is that Marlo cannot actually get drunk. And so he's obsessed with finding something that can get him drunk because he got cursed for doing stuff. And also on this island, you have this gigantic albino crocodile who lives there that Marlo calls Walter. And so we have this albino crocodile. We have this crazy wizard. It's centrally located. A lot of people have been asking us about the Martell company because, you know, they're kind of this East India trading company type vibe that they sort of own the islands, but they don't exactly own the islands. Like what's going on with them? And so they have sort of a base on Marlowe's Island. And so ultimately, Marlowe's Mire, we think, is a very good place to start for the Swordfish Islands as a whole. Like, if you were going to play your very first game in Swordfish Islands, we think that this is the place where you would probably send your players to begin a, an overall Swordfish Islands campaign. Because it's got connections to almost all the islands in some way. So it's kind of got little starter breadcrumb quests, if you will, you know. So you can kind of go anywhere and it makes sense. So with Hot Springs Island, you have Svarku, the evil Ifrit, who's living in the volcano. He has done bad stuff in extra planar spaces and effectively he murdered some people or somebody important and he is hiding out on this island is, is what his whole story is. And he had a buddy who gave him this gem that 
what that does is it puts sort of a bubble around Hot Springs Island so that if you're an extra planar or an extra dimensional creature, you can't see Hot Springs Island. You can't get to Hot Springs Island. It's like there's nothing there. It's like a lost kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. But that causes a real big problem when you have, for example, the Nereids who are on Hot Springs Island and they've had terrible things happening to them since the elves and now Svarku. And they're trying to, you know, save their sisters and get out of this place. So you have this problem where you have a Nereid. She's an extra dimensional elemental creature. She escapes from Hot Springs Island. She swims off into the ocean thinking she's safe and she's going to get help. And now she can't get back. Mm. It's like the island isn't even there. What the hell is happening? I've been sort of captivated by that idea for a really long time. So one of the ways that you can get back to Hot Springs Island, if you're an extra planar character, is by taking a portal directly there. So in Marlowe's Mire, in Walter's Den, there is a portal to the Plane of Water. So in addition to having the hexes from Marlowe's Mire, we're going to have a hex equivalent on the Plane of Water. The idea being your players can go to Marlowe's, they can discover the Swordfish Islands, and then maybe one day they find Nereid and she's like distraught on the beach and she's trying to get back to Hot Springs Island, and they know that it's there, and they can get there, but she can't get there directly. So it's like, will you help me get there? Let's go through the Plane of Water, and then go through this place called the Palace of a Thousand Stone Faces to then basically get back to Hot Springs Island. So it's got you know a kind of direct connection like that to get you over there. And then we decided that it would be really awesome to have like a big airship called the Juggernaut that's owned by the Martel oh, Company. Oh, tell me more about this airship. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so there's this airship. The thought process went like this. Walter is a gigantic 45-foot-plus albino crocodile, you know, kaiju monster. I saw the Gabe has like a, I think it's like an early sketch of him on his Instagram. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Like, I, I can't wait to meet Walter. <laughs> Absolutely. And so the idea was so that the Martel company kind of has a base that's there on Marlowe's. And Walter, Walter is not a god creature. Like the Jumavesi golden crab thing. She's kind of like a goddess creature. Marlo is literally just an animal, but he has some special attributes. You mean Walter? Walter, yes. Walter has some special attributes in that he can be killed, but he comes back. But it's not actually him coming back. I don't know if I'm going to spoil everything. But, don't spoil it. No, uh, say that. All right, book. all right. All right, I won't spoil it. But yeah, so you can kill Walter, and Walter will come back. But if you kill Walter, when Walter comes back, he comes to kill you. So nice. you have these martel captains that are in this ship and they're circling around the island in just like a regular ship they've killed walter then walter comes and trashes ship after ship after ship and so then you know somebody who's in in martel is like hey you know what like i said we shouldn't attack that crocodile anyway i'm a new captain let's send our experimental airship over there so that it's not wrecked by this freaking giant crocodile. Mm -hmm. So now we have a big juggernaut airship that just, you know, circles around, like, what is it doing? Is it there to pick up, like, elven treasures and salvage and stuff? Or is there maybe a more of a malicious intent? Is it trying to figure things out? I can't wait to we see who cool. does the map, <laughs> map for this airship. I know, I know. If only I knew, like, awesome map makers that could do that. But no, Luke was fantastic and said that he would do a map for us. I'm, a, so, I'm very excited to do it to, <laughs> yeah. to draw this airship. I think it was the first line in the email that I sent over to Luke was like, hey, dude, these are just rough ideas. Push it how you want to. Tell us that we're stupid. Make the changes <laughs> that need to be made. Like, we are very open. We want your vision. I mean, Gabe is doing most of the art for the book, right? Yeah, absolutely. Gabe is doing oh, the art yeah. for the book. And then there's Walter's Den. And there is, there's like a cantina that doesn't really mm -hmm. have a name yet, but it's being run by a woman. And her name is Ivy. So we've been kind of calling it Ivy's Cantina or the yeah, Captain's yeah. Cantina or what have you. Is this the Shipwreck Cantina? The Shipwreck Cantina. Tina, yes. Yeah, See, okay. it has multiple names. <laughs> you had pitched it to me as the shipwreck bar. So yes, because that would be awesome to have a map. Because you can never have too many tavern maps, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, what, let's just get this kickstarter to like a hundred k, and then I'll just do a <laughs> bunch of maps for the book. How about that? Come on, I mean, guys. Hey, hey I, I'm open. It's not going to take a lot of work to convince me to do a shipwreck tavern. I'm just right. saying, you know, it's not <laughs> super out of my element, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we'd love to. But you know, at the same time, though, Gabe recently has started trying to do a few maps on his own. I was on his Instagram today, and mm -hmm. I thought to myself, if Gabe ever starts making maps, I'm fucked. Because <laughs> <laughs> the little maps that he had done for the background of his tokens are like, they're so good, you know? Mm -hmm. So. 
the way you guys do books, the intended audience is the book. And this is kind of what we did with Tomb of Black Sand. Like what you want in a map in a book is a lot different than what you want in a VTT map. Yeah. Number one in scale Mm -hmm. alone. But like you don't need to have the details in the map. And it's almost more about like what corridors am I describing and how how are they laying out? It's a much different process than like, okay, this is going to be walled off and they'll be zoomed in on this room. So, you know, there's room for both, you know? Absolutely. Have Gabe do the tavern in the book and then maybe we'll do a VTT down the road. (laughs) Absolutely. You know, that's our request for you is for the juggernaut for in the book, just do black and white line art. But then we have the complimentary, you know, VTT full color, beautiful thing that then maybe that's a poster. Maybe that's just a VTT. We'll see when we get there. So yeah, like we're very excited about that. We want more, but you know, we don't have the budget for, you know, a hundred virtual tabletop yeah. maps so that we can do everything. <laughs> but one day, maybe, I don't know. Oh, we'll yes, see. there's the ever looming <laughs> Hot Springs Island battle map. Uh, dream. Yeah, right. I digress. I did want to touch on because of all this Hot Springs Island talk. You wrote a generator for Pirate Borg, which I mm-hmm. absolutely love. And with your permission, I laid it out in the style of Hot Springs Island. So I feel like you could even use this to add little tidbits to Swordfish Islands if you wanted to, right? Yeah. It's called Uncharted Island. So definitely check that out. Thank you. Any thoughts on the writing process for that? <laughs> no, I mean, that was, it was really fun. I think that it's one of those things where obviously you don't want to get distracted and doing too many projects, even though it's very easy to yeah. get distracted oh God, and do yes. too many projects. But at the same time, it's always good to have something that's just a nice little challenge that's not on something that you've been working on or agonizing over, sure. or at least in my opinion, <laughs> to then like, let's do like a little thing it has got a very small, you know, frame that it needs to fit in and just get it done. That was the way that I approached it. And I loved it. It was very refreshing. Great. To do that. I'm glad to hear that. And I want to say from my end, I am unabashedly kind of a snob when it comes to what I like <laughs> in my stuff. And there are only three contributors in this book. It's you and Pella Nilsson, who wrote Morkborg, and Christian mm-hmm. Eichhorn, who is a incredible Morkborg creator. So yeah, I, I, I was like, uh, this is my book, but if Jacob wants to write something <laughs> for it, I'm okay with that. So I have a few patron questions. Okay. Not Musashi has asked, what is your favorite published adventure? Okay. Well, I did. I got ambushed by Ben Milton of Questing Beast over at North Texas RPG Con. And he asked me what my favorite published adventure was. And I kind of punted. And I think I might also punt again. I feel like this is a bad answer, but maybe it's not a bad answer because, I mean, it was hugely influential on me. At just the right time or the wrong time in my life, I would think I was like 15, my cousin gave me Planescape, the Planes of Chaos box set. And one of the things that I also got was the Factals Manifesto. And so with the Factals Manifesto, you had, I think it's like 12 different factions, and they're all detailed out in that book, and they're all kind of like integrated with each other and they all have the things that they want to accomplish and the things that are stopping them from accomplishing that stuff and even though it wasn't done in the way that hot springs island was eventually done with like what do they want what do they not want that book and that idea of these these factions of people wanting different things and being entangled with each other in these different ways and having this sort of like overarching Uh, philosophy that guides them was just dramatically influential on me. And it was something that really set set the tone and the stage for a lot of the stuff that I've done since then. At the same time, there are tons and tons and tons of phenomenal adventures that are out there. And I have many of them on the shelf behind me, which you can't see, but we can see in the video, you know, as we're chatting with each other. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know because there's, there's a ton. And also, you know, one of the things, like I've always run my own adventures for the most part, even if I had adventures, I was still making stuff up and I was still playing in games where people were making up their own stuff. So I don't read a lot of adventures. There are some where, I mean, I do feel kind of, especially like Zine Quest. Zine Quest is like terrible for me where I'm like, okay, listen, I'm probably never going to run this. I may not even read it because I have so much other stuff that I'm reading and doing and working on, but like, I want to support this creator and I'm going to throw them 20 bucks because like, I love what they're doing but maybe I didn't read it. With the zine thing, and especially this kind of more new school layout art way of doing RPGs, Mm -hmm. you can become influenced by a product without having read it all. For me, the way I create, I have definitely been influenced by things that I own that I have not even finished or maybe even started just because of the the vibe or context. Like a lot of the mothership stuff is like that. Haven't read it all, 
But yeah. the way that they're laying it out, boom, I'm stealing that, you know? Well, and also one of the things too is, is that there is this sort of like nagging voice in the back of my head sometimes that's like, well, Jacob, since you are making adventures right now, you should not be reading other people's adventures because I don't want to like steal their stuff at the same time. Like I don't yeah, want it to be influence. whatever. I had some people like early on when Hot Springs Island came out that they were like, oh man, this is like a better version of the Tomb of Annihilation. And I'm like, I've never read Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah. I don't uh, know they just mean, about They it. just like, mean I, Jungle I Hex Crawl. Well, yeah. No, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that leads to my next question. Uh, Not Musashi's other question was, what's Jacob Hurst's favorite Hex Crawl? I'm going to give an anti-answer. I love it. I like anti-answers. I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for it. It's probably about 10, 12 years at this point, but I was at Dragon's Lair in Austin, one of the best like tabletop role-playing game stores, or well, just, you know, like hobby shops, right? Dragon's Lair is fantastic. Love them. For one reason or another, I don't know if it was a free RPG day, but I don't think they were doing them at that time. Maybe not. But I got a map of Hearn, which is gorgeous. And it's this huge hex crawl map. And I had nothing else for it. I had no other context for it, but it was just like, here's a big, beautiful hex map with nothing that went along with it. Obviously, I know that there's books and stuff, you know, now, but at the time, like, I didn't fully realize that, I guess, because I hadn't checked it out. And so that was one of the things where even then when I when I started looking into it, and I may be misspeaking, so I please forgive me if I didn't do enough homework. But at the time, as I started looking into it, I was like, there's so much empty space here. And it's gigantic. I don't like that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. I want to do literally the opposite of that, where you have a small space that's super dense. Oh, so you're saying the influence is how not to do it yeah okay it kind of okay. for me it was that's why it was sort of an anti-answer yeah, no, like but it. it was because it was such a beautiful map it, like it was gorgeous and i i loved it but at the same time i was like this is exactly what i don't want to do because i felt like it was all flash and no substance kind of and so i was like i want all substance and no flash it drove me at that time and maybe i was being driven off of bad information or i didn't have all the information and i should have spent more time looking for the information but Based on the information I had at the time, that that is how it influenced me. So, yeah. yeah. I love it. Hold fast, wretched sailor. We brace for the broadside barrage. First RPG you ever played? AD&D, first edition. System you would choose to run a Hot Springs Island with? BX or OSE? System you would choose to play Hot Springs Island with as a player? The same. Living person that you have yet to work with that you would love to work on an RPG project with. ZX Sue, if I said his last name correctly. I totally want him to write a field guide in the Swordfish Islands. That is what I want because I want different voices for all of them. I want him to do one at some point because I think it would be phenomenal. I love his stuff. You must check him out. He is so fantastic. What would we know him from? Thousand Thousand Islands. Most recent RPG system you've played? Most recent system I played was 5th edition D&D because I've been playing in a 5e campaign with some friends for a couple years now at this point. But the most recent system that's not 5th edition is Hubris by Mike Evans, because I got to play in one of his games last month, and it was so much fun. It's so easy to just start and play, and that is wonderful. I'm very into systems where it's just like, okay, it takes five minutes to make a character, and now you're playing. A system you've yet to try but want to. I mean, maybe you could alternate, but system that you have not played very much of that you would like to play more of. Mm. Well, pirate boy, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you sly dog! You. I only got to play. I only got to play I, in one I, game. I, I, I want to play. It was nice here that I actually use you as an example because when we played Pirate Borg on that stream, you know, like I think mm -hmm. especially coming from fifth edition, a lot of players are like, "How can I do the most damage right now? How can we win this encounter?" And we would get to your turn in that Pirate Borg, and then you, your guy would—I forget his name—but he would be like, "Oh, I yeah. run and hide," and I would, right. I just like. <laughs> Oh, we're never going to win this encounter that way, but I wish more people would play their characters like that. <laughs> I really, really loved it. You, Jacob Hurst, are suddenly a fifth level PC. What class are you? A thief. Maybe a ranger. I don't know. I'll pretend. <laughs> Add an entry to the what's in the cargo hold of the ship of the dead D100 table. Uh, a broken statue of an angel that's very large, like a large broken marble statue of an angel. I'm imagining, like, uh, if you're familiar with the 40K world, kind of like a Dark mm -hmm. Angels, almost Art Deco style. Oh, yeah, like a like an Art Deco style, for sure. That's what I'm imagining. I was thinking more of sort of like a like a fallen Lucifer cast out of heaven, like screaming into the void kind of fallen Love angel. It. Yeah, like that. Yeah. It is it is entry number one in the D100, Ship of the Dead <laughs> cargo hold. Favorite size die? I'm 
bad with favorites. <laughs> they all have a use. They, they all do. have a different probability. Like, I don't know. It, de- it depends on the situation. I mean, I, if I had to answer this for you, I would, I would say Jacob is going to give a, an anti answer and say 3d6. <laughs> I, yes, yes. <laughs> please get out of my head. And now, um, I just let's feel like you go. can't you can't talk about Jacob Hurst and not mention three d six. Like if you play Hot Springs Island, you have to roll three d six like eight million All times. The time. Yeah. Hot Springs Island location you are most fond of, either as an adventurer or as a designer. I really love the Temple of Tranquility. It was unexpected for me like it really came out of left field as we were going on and we really started adding all the stuff about the steam imps and then i think it was donnie it might have been evan i don't remember who it was but you know we're joking about these steam imps being in there and having like a gambling den and okay so there's like the stage where the bottom falls out and it drops you in if you're a bad performer and telling bad jokes so you can get eaten by these the centipede Great job of the hut yeah exactly and one of them was like oh yeah down at the trank tank and I was like, like the drunk tank, but the trank tank and it's a bar. And, and it really kind of opened up a lot of the idea where, yes, it is a dungeon, but it's a village yeah, really because yeah. it has like these intelligent creatures that are inside of it. And like, I think it kind of became my unintentional favorite spot. And it's, if you would talk to me at the beginning of the process of like what I thought I was going to like the most, that would never have been the answer. And it really surprised me. And I like the vibe. I love our little gambling steam imps. That, yeah. You it's know, ca- it's kind of got like a cantina vibe in that, you know, yeah. It, Shit could really go down there if it if it mm-hmm. wanted to, or it could become a new place where like your players start a little racketeering ring or something, you know? Exactly. It could be a base of operations, or it can be a dungeon, or it can be both. Yeah. Like, why not yeah. everything, yeah. you know? Favorite libation or beverage during your RPG sessions? I really like ciders. I like East Ciders. Like hard ciders? Um, alcoholic ciders? Like hard ciders. Yeah. yeah, hard ciders. There's a place in Austin called East Ciders. And, you know, there are some ciders that are they're just so sweet. And I'm like, meh. And, you know, ciders were, are, were around for a long time. Like, they were a big part of American history, right? Like, mm-hmm. I always understood that that's why Johnny Appleseed was going around throwing apples, is to help plant cider trees and find new apples. And I'm like, you know what? This stuff is good. I can drink tons of it. But then, of course, I do also like Sailor Jerry rum a lot i'm a rum drinker oh, so yeah, yeah. but then look at me making pirate sort of thing so of course of course i am <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason we're friends right <laughs> right right <laughs> video game or computer game you've logged the most hours playing world of warcraft oh nice i i also worked for blizzard for a while so that kind of did it but then also ultima online i spent so much time playing ultima online are you going to any more cons this year? I'm going to be going to ReaperCon in Texas in Labor Day weekend. It's up in Denton. So I actually went to the University of North Texas, which is in Denton. Jacob, where can people find out about the Kickstarter and Swordfish Islands and you? On Twitter, I'm Viderac, which is one of the creatures from Swordfish Islands, V-Y-D-E-R-A-C, and then Swordfish Islands on Instagram and Swordfish Islands on Facebook. But honestly, I barely even look at the Facebook stuff. So if you want to find me, best place is going to be Instagram or Twitter. I'm trying trying to maybe start a TikTok and the idea being that I'll like roll through Hot Springs Island and like kind of roll adventures and do stuff in short little videos. We'll see if that. that actually comes to fruition, but it's Swordfish Press cuz since we've sort of become like publishers of other people's stuff and it's more than Swordfish Islands and we did a reprint, we did a a fancy version of a Jack Vance book, Wist, which is like one of my all-time favorite sci-fi books. It just seems to make sense to maybe change the name from Swordfish Islands to Swordfish Press. So if you go to swordfish.press, that is probably going to slowly become our new website. Otherwise, it's shop.swordfishislands.com, which is where we have all of our books. So, yeah. You've been listening to the Ship of the Dead podcast. Email your questions, comments, and buried treasure tips to shipofthedead at limithron.com. This has been our first episode, so we'd really appreciate it if you would share, tweet, subscribe, and rate us wherever it is that you get your podcasts. You can support the program, join our Discord server, get early access to new episodes, and instantly download hundreds of battle maps, assets, and adventures at limithron.com slash Patreon. Tiers start as low as $2 a release, and you only get charged when I make something new. Pirate Borg, my rules light rum infested hack of Morkborg, is available for pre order at pirateborg.com. Ship of the Dead is produced by Limithron LLC. Our audio editor is Matt Kepler, and our music is by Alexander Miller. <laughs>